All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, I'm Dr. Sally. Uh, it looks like there's quite a few of you that have already signed on for the evening. Um, I'm going to give people a couple more minutes here just to let some late stragglers maybe sign on, and then we'll get started here in just a few minutes. All right, awesome. Looks like we got a few more people that have signed on, and uh, I'm sure some people will still probably be trickling in here kind of slowly, but we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, I'll let you guys just get a visual on me real quick. Hey there, I'm Dr. Sally. Uh, thanks for being here with me tonight for the webinar. Uh, so I'll be doing this whole webinar live for you tonight. Um, we got a couple things that we got to make it through. Uh, and then after the presentation here, uh, I'll open it up for questions. So you guys will have some free time to uh, ask any questions that you want. Um, you can use the question and answer um, uh, application part of the uh, Zoom app uh, to uh, to ask those questions. Uh, and I'll try to answer them the best that I can uh, here live and in person. All right. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, so let's start with who am I? So I'm Dr. Sally, as I said, Jesse Sally. Uh, I've been, uh, working here in the Pittsburgh area, uh, at Regenix, um, for, uh, almost 10 years now. Uh, I'm actually a native of Pittsburgh. I grew up, uh, around the Pittsburgh area, uh, in Fayette County, uh, about an hour South of the city. Um, so I did my undergraduate work at Virginia Tech uh, and the Virginia College of Osteopathic Medicine. So I was in Virginia for about 10 years, um, then came back to Pittsburgh for residency and fellowship at the University of Pittsburgh um, in physical medicine and rehabilitation. And I subsequently got my fellowship in musculoskeletal sports and spine medicine, uh, and now additional expertise in interventional orthopedics, which we'll talk about in a little while. I've been working as a Regenex affiliate since 2015. Um, prior to that, I worked for Washington Hospital in the South Hills of Pittsburgh and was a team doc for the Frontier Baseball League down there. Um, I'm also uh, an avid snowboarder and uh, the father of a new five-month-old little boy. Um, but enough about me, let's talk about why you're here. Uh, so you're here to discuss issues related to pain, most likely. Um, uh, whether that's pain from arthritis or pain in the spine or pain from whatever other, whatever other issue it may be, um, probably looking to avoid surgery. Uh, so we want to hear options on that. Maybe you're not a surgical candidate, or, uh, maybe, uh, somebody told you that you're too young to have surgery. Um, maybe you don't have a lot of downtime that allows for time off of work, or you're just looking for other options. Some people don't want to rely on medications aren't ready to slow down in terms of uh, uh, taking time off, like we said, or you just want more out of your life and more uh, function. So what we're going to talk about today is we're going to go over what Regenex is. Uh, we're going to talk about the current different options in interventional orthopedics. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, Regenex differences, what sets us apart from other people or other uh, clinics that may be doing similar stuff. Uh, we'll talk about who this is for, who candidates are, and then what kind of results we expect to get. So with Regenex, the goal is to help you really see an alternative choice in terms of your care. Most people only have a 
tunnel vision in terms of where they feel like they should go for musculoskeletal care, but we want to give you some different options. We want to help you discover if you're a candidate, uh, is this the right kind of treatment for you? And then help you schedule uh, an appointment with us so you can see one of our expert physicians and get all your questions answered um, there as well. So really what we've seen is there's a gap in the continuum of care as it applies to uh, orthopedics or musculoskeletal medicine, where there's really not a lot of good options between sort of your typical conservative care medications, physical therapy, bracing, injections, or going on to surgery. So Regenex likes to nestle itself uh, right in between uh, conservative care and the need for surgery and give you some additional options. So surgeries uh, obviously is a very sought after intervention uh, in the United States. Um, you can see all these different numbers here on the skeleton are the amount of surgeries for those areas that are performed per year. So it's quite a few. Um, however, most of these procedures uh, aren't completely covered uh, on health plans. You know, there's still some out-of-pocket costs that come with these uh, procedures for a lot of people. And with the procedures, there's a lot of increased risk. So you can see on the left-hand side, your increased risk of very bad things like heart attack, stroke, nerve damage, infection, blood clots, and even death uh, is increased um, into the upwards of about 300% after surgery. So uh, anything that we can do to avoid those uh, things is obviously what we might want. So the goal optimally is to stop cutting stuff out, stop cutting out body parts and, and things that we actually need in the body and start using injected biologic agents from your own body that help with reducing pain and improving function. So that brings us to what is interventional orthopedics. Um, so basically what we're trying to do is we're transitioning from knives to needles. So we're going from scalpels and big incisions and cutting out big parts of the body to using more interventional treatments uh, like needles to place things right where they need to go very precisely. And this is kind of like uh, switching to interventional cardiology. Before it used to be a big issue where if you had a heart problem, you had to have a big surgery where they went in through the chest and, and uh, it was very involved and very gory. Um, now they've switched some of their surgeries to using cameras that they feed up through veins uh, and they can do a lot of work on the heart more interventionally. So it's a lot more minimally invasive and a lot safer for patients. So that's what we're trying to do with orthopedic care, switch to these um, minimally uh, invasive procedures uh, that um, are saving you from uh, uh, more involved surgical procedures and having better outcomes. So interventional orthopedics, as I said, less invasive, new medical specialty. Uh, we're using what we call orthobiologics, which are delivered by injection. Orthobiologics are basically cells within your body, within your own body, that uh, are that we use to direct healing processes and to help with uh, tissue repair. Um, it's a lower risk alternative, obviously, than going through these big, uh, large, involved invasive surgeries. Regenex is a branch of interventional orthopedics. Uh, it's a group across the country of highly selected um, physicians uh, that all practice in a network. Um, we have a set of protocols that we use within this network that helps to get us the best possible cells and the best possible treatments and the best possible results for patients. Regenex as a network has been one of the world leaders in research and development for these types of procedures. Uh, and they have uh, their own self-funded employee practices. So it's not... Um, it's not like a major corporation like you would think of with like UPMC or Highmark or any of these things. Uh, you know, we're uh, we're a very selective uh, network in and of ourselves. Uh, so the common conditions that we tend to treat are the same common conditions that you would normally present to an orthopedic office to have an evaluation for. So whether it's spines or hips or knees or ankles, basically what I tell patients is we treat everything from the top of the neck all the way to the tip of the toes. Um uh, so we have lots of different options for lots of different problems that would affect all the different things that you would see an orthopedic physician for normally. Uh, this is kind of a brief uh, picture of uh, the equipment that we typically use in the clinic. Um, uh, we have an ultrasound machine on the far right and x-ray machines uh, elsewhere in the room. These are the machines that help us to place these needles very precisely into joints or into other tissues so that we're delivering 
the orthobiologics in a, in a very precise, precise manner for the best outcomes. Uh, this is our, um, our uh, ISO lab uh, hood that we, um, that we have in the clinic. This is where the actual cell processing happens by hand when the cells are actually removed from your body. So when we take out blood or when we take out bone marrow, we're actually processing it right there in the clinic. It doesn't go to a third party site. Uh, nothing gets sent out of the clinic. So everything happens right there in the office uh, that same day. Uh, this is a picture of a patient that had, uh, you know, pretty easily uh, performed procedures. Again, we're looking at just applying Band-Aids uh, for needle injections. We're not looking at uh, big steri strips or other big uh, uh, dressings for large scalpel incisions or uh, uh, sutures or anything that requires a lot of care even after the uh, procedure. So very minimally invasive, uh, very minimal pain, um, and, you know, not a lot of downtime because of that. So let's talk about some different, uh, more cutting edge, I guess, examples of interventional orthopedics. Um, right now, what we're looking at is we're even using these cells to repair ACLs. Uh, so a lot of people hear about ACL injuries. It's a common sports injury. It's a common injury in a lot of different people. Um, we're now using cells uh, under uh, x-ray guidance and ultrasound guidance um, to be able to place these cells very specifically in the ACL uh, to help with tissue repair, and it's actually working very effectively. Uh, this is a, um, a image of a procedure done on the shoulder. Uh, so this is actually a shoulder injection, and then an injection into the shoulder labrum, which is a very difficult uh, structure to see, and it's a very difficult structure to actually inject. Um, you know, normally surgeries for this would involve uh, uh, arthroscopic or open procedures to help with repair of this, but we can do it by just injecting um, under x-ray guidance. Uh, there's some new procedures now where we're actually injecting cells into the structure of the bone for better uh, healing of joints. Um, you can see on the far left uh, the image, I know it's uh, a little unclear, but there's a, uh, there's a, a bone marrow lesion in the kneecap up here. And what we're actually doing is placing the cells directly into the bone uh, for purposes of better healing in both the bone and in the joint itself. Um, we do this under uh, very sterile conditions, uh, surgical, full surgical prep, uh, and again, using the, uh, the x-ray guidance for uh, exact placement with these procedures. Um, <clears throat> this is a brief video of us utilizing uh, a very small gauge, 30-gauge uh, needle uh, to place these uh, this uh, uh, these cells around the median nerve, which is what is affected in carpal tunnel syndrome. Uh, and uh, just like this says, uh, this is about the size of a pea. Uh, so you can see like, the um, the placement of the needles for these procedures is very precise, but very effective. So how does regenerative medicine typically work? So we want to talk about the different types of cells. We'll start with uh, PRP or platelet-rich plasma. Uh, this is using uh, growth factors that are found in platelets within the blood. Uh, these growth factors uh, help with amplifying healing. So you can almost think of the platelets in the blood as like espresso shots for the local repair cells. So they're basically getting the cells all riled up uh, and emitting the growth factors that help these repair cells to heal tissue. Uh, the platelets make these other repair cells work harder and for longer periods of time to optimize healing. Stem cells kind of act like the general contractors for the repair job. So they tell other cells, uh, you know, what to do to repair the damage. And they also use the, uh, the growth factors from the platelets, from the espresso shots, to help uh, these cells or to help the heal the tissues faster uh, and get more done. Um, your, all, your own cells can also turn into the bricks and mortar that replace the cells that were damaged. So uh, the stem cells are actually doing the work to actually create tissue and tissue repair. So what do we typically use? Uh, you know, in most cases, I would say we're using a vast majority of uh, platelet-rich plasma or platelet-based treatments. This is very good for the spine. This is very good for certain types of arthritis uh, and, and ligament and tendon injuries. 
Uh, and then I would say the rest of the time we're using the stem cells and the platelets in combination to treat more advanced arthritis or other uh, issues that are more involved. Um, which treatment we decide to use is more so based on your evaluation and your examination. And we tailor that specifically to the, to the patients and what the patients need. Um, not everyone needs stem cells. So we, uh, we tend to, uh, uh, want to make sure that we're giving you the best possible treatment that we can for what you have going on. So which one is for you? Uh, what it says here is, you know, kind of on average, PRP is usually used for smaller joints like the fingers and the toes or some of the smaller joints in the spine, uh, areas where there's less severity of arthritis, uh, maybe more mild to moderate arthritis. Um, it's also very good for ligament issues and tendon issues, and it's pretty much primarily what we use in the spine. I've used it for smaller rotator cuff tear, uh, tears. I've used it for meniscus uh, related issues in the knee. So there's uh, and labral uh, things in the shoulder and in the hip. So there's all different sorts of uses for that. Uh, bone marrow derived um, stem cells. That's typically what we use for more involved uh, issues like larger joints, knees, hips, shoulders uh, with more damage, more advanced arthritis, larger rotator cuff tears, uh, things that um, need a lot of uh, 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 tissue repair to heal. Um, and then um, more so into the bone, if the bone is starting to break down and we need to help with repair that way. So a lot of people want to know, what am I going to have to expect during a stem cell procedure? Well, a stem cell procedure has three different parts. Uh, the first part is actually using a type of injection uh, to help with priming the joint before we introduce the stem cells. Uh, so it's kind of like tilling the soil before you plant a garden. Um, and what this uh, series of injections does is it helps to stimulate your body's natural immune response to the area that we're trying to treat. Uh, and it helps to stimulate a response within that joint so that the, the, when, the, when we introduce the stem cells a couple of days later, they're going to know what they're supposed to do when they get in there. Uh, this prepares the site to take full advantage of those stem cells when we introduce them a couple of days later. Uh, so the second day, which is usually about two or three days after the first treatment, um, is the, the first part of that day is the stem cell harvest. And this is the part that I think most people get a little bit uh, weirded out by, but the cells actually come from the bone marrow and we use uh, an area on the back side of the pelvic bone. Uh, it's called the iliac crest. There's nothing in that area uh, or overlying that area except basically fat tissue and, and butt muscle. So um, it's an area that's very safe to harvest from. There's not a lot of vascularity or other uh, big nerves or anything around this area. Um, so we use uh, a lot of anesthetic to numb up the skin. Um, and we use a very small gauge needle to get into the bone and to get the stem cells out. Most patients find, you know, very pretty minimal discomfort with this procedure. Um, you know, a lot of patients after we finish the procedure say, that wasn't anywhere near as bad as I thought it was going to be. But um, basically, we utilize a very specific protocol to extract these cells uh, so that we know we're going to get the most cells to be able to treat your uh, affected area. Um, and we re-inject those uh, cells back into the damaged area on that same day. So this is the first part. Um, this Later on in that day, after a couple hours when we've had time to process the cells, that's when we're going to take those stem cells and put them back into the area that's problematic. So this is really planting the seeds. So we we tilled the soil. Now we're planting the seeds. Uh, so we do the injections into the areas where there's damage and pain or, or arthritic change or tears or whatever it may be. We're using those cells from the bone marrow aspiration. So it's not any other third party cells that we're using from any other sources. Um and then we use precise guidance, like I said, with the x-ray or with the ultrasound for precise cell placement. And like I said, that re-injection takes place a couple hours after the harvest on that same day. So you're not having to wait uh, to get that done. Uh, after that, after that re-injection, uh, a couple more days are going to go by and then we're going to do the last injection. The last injection is going to be where we take platelets from the blood. We'll do a blood draw from your arm. And we separate the platelets and we use the platelets like fertilizer. So we've tilled the soil, we plant the seeds, and then we want to fertilize the seeds. So the platelets, like we said before, act like those espresso shots 
to really get those stem cells working and really uh, uh, amplify that stem cell response. Um, so uh, the lab processing for that, for the platelets, only takes about an hour. So it's a pretty uh, fast uh, in and out um, injection that same day. And it doesn't involve a lot of injections. It's usually only just one. So um, a little bit about the history of Regenex. Uh, Regenex was the first uh, kind of conglomerate within the United States that started doing uh, stem cell procedures on human patients um, that were uh, having arthritic musculoskeletal issues uh, and sort of documenting that process uh, over time. Uh, we've done the most procedures related to interventional orthobiologics, uh, and we have sort of the uh, the research uh, or the um, the network backing with that. Uh, it's safe. We've actually proven that with a safety paper that we'll talk about here in a, in a little bit. And it's the most research. Regenex has uh, put out probably some of the most research. Uh, a, a large, probably 30 to 40% of the current research that's out there in orthobiologics um, that's being used today to treat patients. Uh, like I said, they published the world's largest safety paper on these types of procedures showing the safety of uh, stem cell-based therapies for orthopedic conditions. Basically, the, the most adverse effect that, that they've had over the course of the years of the study was just discomfort at the injection site. So, you know, risk of those big things that we looked at earlier, like stroke and heart attack and death and nerve damage and all these other things, they're all pretty much non-existent after these types of procedures. So uh, very, very minimal risk of any uh, of any adverse problems. Um, the, the registry that Regenex has, uh, has um, now way over 34,000 uh, patients that are being followed. I'd say it's almost probably double this number. Um, and uh, there have been a, a lot of peer-reviewed uh, papers that have been published from the data that's lo uh, located in the registry. Um, and there's ongoing research that's still being done for different things like rotator cuff tears uh, and other uh, things. And they're working on additional outcome tools to, to see what's possible with what we can do with these procedures and how people are responding to them down the road. Um, basically what this research and what all these different tools do is they stack the deck in your favor. So, you know, we go through all this research and we go through all these uh, registries and we go through all this data to make sure that we're giving you the patient the best possible treatment that we can with the information that we have. Um, so whether it's uh, doctors and imaging, you know, using precision to get these cells where they need to be, you know, research and safety, making sure that these treatments are uh, are, are very good for you and, uh, and don't have a lot of negative downfalls, um, making it personalized for you. So making sure that the treatments that we do fit the specific needs that you have um, and evaluation and candidacy, you know, making sure that if we're if you have a problem that we can treat that problem effectively after evaluating it and, and seeing, you know, what are the different things that we have to go through to do that. We also are very upfront about transparency with what we think the outcomes are going to be and, and what the cost would be related to those procedures. So who is this type of a treatment for? Well, it's for people that really want to avoid surgery. I mean, people don't want to have to go through surgery. So this is kind of the option that sits between conservative care and, and not having to go through surgery. Um, you get to keep all of your parts. So, uh, you know, you keep your, your knee joint, you keep, uh, you know, anything that you, that you need to, um, your rotator cuff or whatever it is, nothing gets tacked back down, nothing gets cut off. Um, you don't have time, you know, you don't have time specifically for a lengthy rehab or for a lot of downtime. You have to get back to work. Um, you know, you want to be able to, to do the things that you want to do. So it keeps you from needing uh, to be down for long periods of time. People that don't want drugs. Um, there's plenty of instances where we're getting people off of chronic anti-inflammatory use, off of, you know, needs for narcotic medications um, or other uh, uh, nerve related drugs or, or muscle relaxers or whatever it is. Uh, people aren't needing that kind of thing anymore. Um, Maybe you've had a failed surgery before. Uh, maybe it was the other knee that you had replaced that you weren't really happy with. 
maybe you still have pain that you want to have evaluated from the surgery that you had. Um, or maybe you're just too young for surgery. Uh, we've had patients that have come in that, you know, their doctors tell them they need knee replacements and they're maybe only in their forties and they tend to respond to these things very, very well. So the results, uh, basically what we can say is the best practices yield the best outcomes. And, and what we try to do as a clinic and as a Regenex provider is we are instilling the best practices that we have known, um, both in terms of research and in uh, execution, uh, with giving these procedures to you at the at the highest level to give you the best possible outcomes that we have, whether it's from drawing the cells to processing the cells to which cells we use to how we place them, um, you know, the best outcomes are going to be from the the work that we do and our high level of expertise in delivering these treatments very effectively. Uh, less pain, you know, obviously people don't want to be in pain. You want to have less pain. So that's what we're, that's the ultimate goal is to get rid of the pain that limits you and, uh, and it's making things miserable, uh, increased function. People want to be out there doing more things, being able to go to the store, play with grandkids, you know, garden, go back to pickleball, whatever it might be that you, uh, that you want to get back to. We want to try to get you back there. And obviously if you're doing those things, then you're happier. Uh, you know, you're, uh, better in social situations, you know, you're, you're more, um, you're more lively for the people that you're around in your day to day. And that just makes life that much better. And being off of pain medication, you know, nobody wants to be on narcotic medications. If we can get people away from that, that's a huge win for us. But even just, you know, anti-inflammatories, people that are using these types of medications every day, there are more long-term effects that we're finding that are problems with these, uh, with use of even these over-the-counter medications. So getting people as far away from needing medication on a daily basis as we possibly can is a big win. Um, and then, you know, obviously getting you back to your preferred level of uh, active lifestyle. So what are four reasons to really take your health off of hold today? Stop avoiding the surgery. Um, you know, the longer you wait, the worse this condition is probably going to get. I know a lot of people say, well, I'll just wait until after the holiday or I'll just wait until next summer or I'll just wait until next year. And, you know, as we kind of put that off, it gets easy to sort of deal with that on a day to day basis. And people just become accustomed to being in pain. And, you know, I, I hate for, to have people sort of, uh, you know, uh, conform the circumstances of their life to their pain. So we want to try to get you away from that and get you back to, you know, obviously the fitness and, and weight level that you want to be back at. So get your fitness back, get your weight levels back in check. Um, you know, a lot of people want to be more active. This is a good way to get that process started. Increase quality time with loved ones. It's like I said, you want to be chasing your grandkids around, or you want to be, uh, you know, going on runs with your significant other, or you want to be uh, able to be out there playing pickleball or shooting hoops or whatever it is. People want to do what they want to do, and it gives you time uh, to be able to go out and do that. And no one's getting any younger, um, you know, uh, and I say that in the setting of, you know, uh, at a certain point, uh, even surgeons will say, you're probably too old to get this surgery. But, you know, we can treat people even into very uh, old ages. I've treated people even up to age 98, but there's no reason to wait that long. Uh, you know, if you want to get back to, you know, being... Um, a lot more capable and a lot stronger. Uh, now's the time to do it. Um, so as far as finances, uh, a lot of people ask the question of how much is this procedure going to cost me? Well, uh, in terms of just coming in and talking to me or one of the other doctors within our clinic, the initial consultation and any follow-ups, any diagnostics that we might need to order or any bracing or any physical therapy or anything like that, all of that stuff is going to be covered by your insurance. So you don't have to worry about, you know, outside of your deductibles or your co-pays, that'll be the stuff that you're responsible. We're not in control of that. But, you know, everything that we do outside of the procedures is, is covered by your insurance. And the, the insurance just doesn't cover any procedures that we do that are related to orthobiologics. So the prolotherapy, the PRP or the platelet-based treatments, and then the stem cells. And these different treatments, there's a wide range of, of prices that this comes with because uh, it's based on sort of what you need and what we what, what type of treatment we need to do. So it's it's kind of across the board for everybody. But one thing that I can tell you is to look at 
how much money it would actually cost you through your insurance to go through a traditional orthopedic surgery. In a lot of cases, those copays or the deductibles may actually end up costing you more than what it would actually be to undergo one of these treatments. And the other things I tell people to look at are look at how much time you would be required to be off of work and the lost wages that come with that after a traditional orthopedic surgery. If you're looking at significant amounts of downtime, weeks, months, where you can't do work, um, that's going to be a lot of money lost out of pocket. If there's a lot of rehabilitation that comes with that, that's going to be a lot of co-pays that you're going to have to pay to therapy. So I oftentimes will have patients think about, you know, how, what's your downtime? How much time will you be off work? How much will the actual surgery cost? And then how much rehab will you have to go through? And what will that look like? Because that does end up being a significant cost for a lot of people a lot of the time. So next steps for you, if you are interested, if this is something that you think you would be interested in, and believe me, it's worth it to come in and talk to us and ask us the questions and, and have us see you. You know, you don't need a referral, uh, so you can come in and, and just call us and we can get you in and on the schedule. Um, if you have imaging, M MRIs or x-rays, gather them up and bring them. If you don't, don't worry about it. That's something that we can talk about or we can get if we feel like we need it. Uh, call the Regenex liaison. Uh, we'll give, I'll give you the number here in just a second. You can give her a call and you can uh, have them schedule an appointment so we can get you in there. And that appointment can be in person. It could be telemedicine if you're coming from a long way away. Um, but we prefer to see you in person because that you know allows us to actually give you a good evaluation and, and talk more there. Um, if we feel like we need some more imaging, we can get it if you don't have it before the, the visit. So don't let that stop you. We'll let you know if you're a candidate and what treatment we think you're a good candidate for. Um, You'll get the treatment, then, you know, maybe go through a little bit of rehab and then get back to your life. So that's what we want to try to do. That's the that's the plan. That's the step plan step by step. So next step for you, schedule a new patient eval. Uh, this is the contact information. 412-963-6480 is the number. Um, you'll talk to Sarah and she'll get you in um, and on the schedule and you can get in there and speak with us in person. So that's the end of the presentation. I'm going to open it up now for uh, questions from you guys. Um, and I will put my video back on here so you can actually see that I'm still here talking to you. Um, so any questions that you guys have about anything that I talked about here tonight? You can go right into the question and answer section here and... Uh, Ask me anything, really. I'm here for you guys. So far, I'm not seeing anything yet. I'll give you guys a couple of minutes. I know sometimes it takes a little bit to type some things sometimes. Here we go. Uh, so Ryan asks, if stem cells don't make cartilage, don't make cartilage, how does it help the pain to go away? It's a good question, Ryan. Uh, you know, these procedures are not designed to basically rebuild you a 25 year old knee. I mean, everybody would like that, but unfortunately that's just not how it works. Um, the stem cells, when they're introduced into a joint, almost act like a uh, clear coat on a car, uh, on paint. So when we introduce the cells, we introduce them uh, into the surface of the joint, and that helps to create a protective layer over the surface of the joint. Um, if there is damage within the bone, we also inject cells into the bone structure. And what that does is it actually helps to uh, heal the bone from the inside out. Uh, so the pain actually goes down from the protective layer that's on the surface of the bone and also the, the healing from the inside, the subcortical bone, which is usually where a lot of the pain comes from. Uh, then there's some the biochemical changes that happen within the joint itself that also alleviate a lot of pain and inflammation from just that cartilage being worn down. So there are a lot of ways which the, the cells actually help without directly rebuilding the cartilage and that 
uh, helps to to for that relief to last for a significant amount of time, even up to uh, 15 years now with the current research that's being done. Good question. Um, Jeff asks, what's the cost of the initial evaluate, uh, consultation? I just said, if you, ha if you uh, have insurance, it's covered by your insurance. So, uh, you know, you're, you're more than welcome to make an appointment. Uh, it would just be whatever the cost of the copay is for you to see a, a specialist. That would be the only thing. So, um, you know, that's, uh, that's, that's variable insurance to insurance, but, uh, but it is covered by your insurance. Um, Pamela asks, do the stem cells move to any other parts in the body? Maybe attaching to a cancer cell and making them grow. No. Um, now there are certain restrictions that we have in place uh, for patients that have active cancer and, and how long we need people to be in remission before doing certain types of treatments for them. Um, that's different case to case. Um, but uh, these cells or these injections do not cause cancer in any, they haven't in any research that's ever been done in any of these orthobiologic studies uh, with causing cancer uh, acutely in joints or creating, you know, making cancer cells grow or anything like that. Um, Ken asks, uh, is there additional treatment after the initial three days tilling, planting, fertilizing? Uh, usually no. Um, that's the, the typical three day treatment. Um, and, uh, you know, we kind of just monitor after that to see how things go. Um, it, you know, we're usually not having to do any additional treatment uh, after that in most cases. Um, there are some things that come up here and there with uh, maybe tendon issues or things like that, you know, later on as people are more active or things like that, that we kind of take on a case by case basis. But for the most part, treating that joint, that's what happens within those three days. Uh, and that's usually very effective for treatment. Um, Margaret asks, do you use Novocaine for numbing. Um, so we, we do, we usually do, we usually use lidocaine for surface numbing. We have some alternatives, um, but, uh, uh, but yeah, that's typically the, the one that we use in most cases. Um, Mark asks for low back pain, is PRP good for facet joints and soft tissue like ligaments, tendon muscles? Absolutely. Uh, for low back pain, PRP is the typical treatment that we're using for facet joints and for uh, ligaments, tendons, muscles within the low back. Uh, the treatment uh, in those areas is very effective and very good and usually uh, does give a lot of good pain relief for long periods of time. Good question, Mark. Uh, Justin asks, what are the cleaning standards for the lab? Are there inspection certifications for approved cleaning? Uh, yes, there are standards for sterilization. Yes, that is inspected and certified routinely. Um, infection is the biggest concern, however rare it may be. Yes, infection in any right is the biggest concern for anything uh, that you do in, in any medical situation. Um, so yeah, uh, we use very good sterile techniques when we're performing the procedures. Uh, the lab is routinely sterilized and, and cleaned, and there are specifications that we have to meet with that um, uh, on multiple different levels. So yes, that, that is a good question, but yes, we do meet those standards. Uh, Andrew asks, you mentioned risk can be pain at the injection site. I assume it's acute or chronic pain. Um, also scarring process can sometimes grab onto these nerves causing chronic pain. So no. So by pain at the injection site, I just meant discomfort from where we actually put the needle in on the skin. So we're not talking about like chronic pain from scar tissue or chronic pain from nerve damage or scarring around nerves or anything like that. Um, so the, the, the answer to that is the, the minimal in pain at the injection site is just the actual like needle poking the skin and the soreness that comes from that, not a more chronic process in that regard. Um, that's a question from anonymous is, is it the same concept as microfracture to create fibrous tissue in the hip joints? No, it's a much different concept than microfracture. Microfracture is actually uh, damaging the surface cartilage uh, to try to create blood flow within the joint or to create, um, you know, more healing. And uh, this is a very different process uh, from that. Um, Christina asks, for a knee, what is the rehab recovery time with the stem cell platelet treatment? So everybody's a little bit different in terms of their rehab, but I would say it's usually anywhere 
between like three and four weeks. That's the typical time that people would do physical therapy um, with no extreme exercise, just walking, biking, golf, how long will it last? Um, the, uh, like I said earlier, the typical time frames are somewhere, you know, with the current research, we're looking at up to 15 years, uh, but we don't know any, you know, we don't know much beyond that. It does depend on what type of treatment we're doing. And there's a lot of variance within that. But, uh, but, you know, if we, if we do the procedure and we get the joint stable and, and the rehab is good, um, you know, the hope is that we would want to get you back to exercise like walking or biking or golf. You know, that's what we that's the ultimate goal. So, you know, even within doing that, we're still looking at these long term outcomes. Um, Laura asks, if you have issues in both knees, can you treat both at the same time? It depends on what we're doing, but um, the short answer to that is yes. It just depends on uh, what kind of treatments we're doing for both knees. So we would have to kind of take that uh, on a case by case basis. Um, Jeff asks, what can be done for someone with DJG in the hip with narrowing joint space? Will this expand space for the movement of the joint? Um, we do treat hip issues all the time joint degeneration in the hip. Uh, there's nuances behind that. And again, it, it, it's best if we can get you in the clinic and actually like seen so we can see what's really going on with the joint, how it moves, uh, and what we might need to do. Um, there are things that we can do to help with the range of motion and help with that joint expansion. Um, so it's worth coming in and talking to us so we can make that delineation, uh, more easily. Uh, Ryan asks, why do some procedures use fat stem cells versus uh, going into the bone marrow? Uh, so with there are different forms of stem cells in the body. The, the adipose derived or the fat derived stem cells um, to actually extract stem cells from the fat tissue, you have to actually add a, um, a different enzyme into that fat tissue uh, called collagenase. And that helps to break down that fat and release the stem cells. But to do that procedure in the United States is actually illegal under the direction of the FDA. Um, so people are still using adipose derived stem cells, but they're using some minimally and minimally manipulative techniques to try to release some of those cells. It's not as effective as directly acquiring those stem cells from the bone marrow. Um, so in head to head studies, uh, the research tends to favor the 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 bone marrow derived stem cells as opposed to the fat derived stem cells, at least the fat derived stem cells that don't undergo that that uh, that extraction, which again, in a lab setting in certain areas in the United States, they can do that, but they can't do that in a clinical setting. Um, so uh, Sheila asks, if you have bone on bone, or I have a bone on bone in my left knee, would this therapy help? Yes. Uh, so yes, Sheila, uh, it, we do treat bone on bone arthritic changes all the time, uh, in joints. Um, that's a great question, but I would say the majority of the patients that do come and see us do have bone on bone arthritis. I mean, we deal with all sorts of different issues from a musculoskeletal standpoint, but, um, yes, we, you know, bone on bone arthritis in the knees is kind of the bread and butter treatment that we do in most cases. Um, Deborah asks, if I have knee procedures, how long can I expect to be pain-free? Uh, again, this is, you know, this is variable. I'm gonna, I'll, I'll let you guys know again, the pain relief is variable. Um, but I would say the research that we have now shows that it, the pain relief can be up to 15 years and even beyond. We don't know beyond that, but that's just the most recent studies that we have. Um, so, you know, we, we kind of, look at that uh, uh, based on sort of how you are and how you're doing and, and how things go after the procedure. But that's the that's the expectation and the hope with everybody that we treat. Um, success rate for removing scar tissue from previous surgeries in a finger. Um, again, that's something that we would just have to look at in the clinic. I'm not really sure um, because that's not something that we would treat routinely. Um, but uh, uh, like I said, we're not doing surgery. We're not removing tissue. Uh, you know, we're doing this to kind of help with, um, with issues that are happening within tendons and things like that, Brenda, but we could address that more so on a case by case basis with you. Um, 
what is prolotherapy used for? Prolotherapy is used uh, in some situations for uh, uh, joint and ligament instability. Um, it can be used for uh, mild ligamentous pain or uh, or other areas like in the spine where people may have some pain within muscles or ligaments. Um, it doesn't do the same thing as PRP. PRP is a is almost like a very much enhanced version of prolotherapy. Prolotherapy doesn't actually contain any growth factors or healing factors. It just activates that healing response or activates that inflammation within tissue. Um, but it doesn't actually provide that same cellular healing that PRP does. So PRP is kind of like advanced prolotherapy. Um, anonymous asks, uh, if you do a stem cell hip procedure and find that the bone needs fixed, I, I mean, so I'll say this, you guys are asking very good questions, but you're asking very, uh, advanced questions. Um, so it's, I know you guys want to know all sorts of information on your own individual cases, but it's going to be really hard for me to answer questions on sort of very specific issues. Um, unless we see in the clinic what's going on and we can kind of, you know, cause I said, everybody's a little bit different in terms of their, their pathology. Everybody's a little bit different in terms of what we do. So, you know, it's a lot easier for me to answer more specific questions uh, if you guys come into the clinic and, and actually sit down with me and we can talk through it uh, and see what we need to do. Um, can a lumbar disc increase height without having direct PRP injection? Uh, usually not. Once a, once a lumbar disc starts to deteriorate, it usually continues to deteriorate um, over time. Uh, PRP uh, can help significantly with reducing pain and, and improving stability in discs that have, uh, that have deteriorated. We do that type of a procedure, uh, all the time. And then people usually get very, very good results with it. Um, so people asking about surgery, I don't know, uh, questions about surgeries. Cause again, I'm not a surgeon. I'm, we're not doing surgery. Um, so I can't necessarily answer questions, uh, about surgery specifically. Um, so again, so Pam asks about, there's an office in Pittsburgh that is using stem cells from donated umbilical cords. Would there be some advantage to that? Uh, the short answer to that is no. Um, you know, there's no difference between the stem cells that you're using, right now in your body versus the stem cells that, you know, you had when you were a baby. Um, so stem cells are just that they're just undifferentiated cells. So it doesn't matter if they come from an umbilical cord. It doesn't matter if they come from your bone marrow. Uh, there's no advantage. You know, you don't, your stem cells don't age as you age. Like so your stem cells now work the same way that they did when you were a kid. Um, and they're still working. So when you cut yourself, you still heal when you, you know, they're fixing things within your body every second of every day. So your stem cells are still doing what they need to do. And when we do these procedures, we still get uh, the amount of stem cells that we need to be able to do these treatments effectively. Donated cells, you never know where they're coming from. Uh, that's number one. So it's always a third party. So you don't know what they are or where they're coming from. Number two, in the process of actually extracting those cells and um, and processing them and going through a lot of the different things that need to happen to make them effective, uh, a lot of times the cells die or the cells stop working to the point where they cannot form units that actually create tissue healing. And that's been studied in multiple different studies across uh, large institutions. Uh, and that's part of the reason that the umbilical stem cells now are no longer uh, being recognized as a treatment option by the FDA. So um, I would I would throw up caution if somebody's talking about umbilical cells or if they're talking about um, uh, amniotic cells or anything like that. Um, you know, basically we we stick with bone marrow derived stem cells because that's the best. Your your source of it is the best, and, and that's what uh, what gives people the best outcomes. Um. Can you rehab yourself or is it better to do PT? I always think it's better to do PT. 
Uh, they know way more than the average person about how the body works and operates. And uh, most of the time, even people that are advanced exercisers, including myself, uh, with the treatments that I've had, uh, PR, uh, PT has been a much uh, better effective means to get better outcomes uh, after procedures for sure. Um, how effective is treatment for plantar fasciitis with PRP? It's great, Lori. Great question. Um, PRP for plantar fasciitis is fantastic. I've done it in a lot of patients and the outcomes have been great. Um, anonymous asked, some stem cell procedures have one step procedure. Regenix as a three-step procedure is one way better and why. Yes, the three-step procedure is better for the reasons that I explained. You know, you're, you're, you're prepping the joint, you're doing the procedures, and then you're fertilizing the procedures. Um, so if you're skipping those steps, there's reasons and there's research backing for why we put those steps in place. Uh, so it's not just because we want to inject you more. It's because each step that we do with that helps to advance this procedure and make these outcomes better for you. So, uh, yes, the three-step process is way better. And that's the reason that we do it that way. Um, Mark says, I've read about platelet poor plasma. Is this opposite of PRP? What are its applications? We have platelet poor plasma that we, so platelet poor plasma is basically what's left when you take away the platelet rich plasma. So we have platelet poor plasma for every patient that we do. I'd say most of the time we don't use it because it doesn't really have that much therapeutic benefit. Um, in some cases I can use it to kind of expand volumes uh, for injections if we need to cover larger areas. But uh, for the most part, uh, it doesn't really have a lot of good therapeutic benefit and, uh, it, it's not really something that we use, uh, in, in any application for musculoskeletal care. Um, how do the, so anonymous ask, how do the stem cells stay in place for 10 to 15 years? It's not that they stay in place for 10 to 15 years. That's not how the, uh, biomechanics of stem cells work. Uh, they create the processes that that cause that joint stability to maintain that better homeostasis for that long of a time. Stem cells aren't like jelly. They're not like, uh, you know, the jelly inside of a donut where if you squish them out, they're going to separate and disperse everywhere. That's not how they work. Um, you know, like I said, stem cells are constantly repairing things that happen within your body all the time. So your body is always regenerating and using stem cells. Basically, what we're doing is we're kind of enhancing that process and putting it right where it needs to be. And then, um, you know, letting that process sort of take its own course over the years. And that is where that sustained relief sort of happens. Um, Gary asks, I missed the first 30 minutes. Sorry, it may have been addressed. Uh, to say, to answer the question of why it's is or is not covered by insurance, that's another two hour lecture. Um, we'll just say this insurance companies aren't ready to cover it yet. Um, there's a lot of reasons for that. Uh, and it's not because we haven't put forth the research to provide them with the information that they need in terms of showing that these procedures have very good outcome for patients and they're safe and they're very effective and they're easy to do. Um, there are just certain cri levels of criteria for insurances where they say you have to meet these, you have to rise to these levels or we, we're not gonna cover it. And it's just very hard to design those studies uh, and execute that in a way that they want us to. Um, Anonymous asked, did you have a Regenix procedure? Yes, I did. I have, I've had two. I had um, uh, one for my shoulder. I had a rotator cuff tear and I had one for my elbow for a uh, uh, tendonitis in my elbow. Um, Laura asks, uh, I'm two hours from Pittsburgh. Do most patients stay local for the three days? Um, it's different for everybody. Uh, some people will uh, come in and they'll stay depending on, you know, how far they, they drive. You know, I've had some people that will drive back and forth, uh, or they'll have a driver and they'll go back and forth. Like I said, it just depends on what we're doing and how involved it is and, and, uh, and what patients need during that time. And that's something that we can address, uh, for your case as we kind of go through it. These are really good questions, guys. I'm, I'm, I'm happy that you guys are, are very curious about this. This is, this is good stuff. And I feel like, um, you know, you guys are showing a lot of interest in that. That's that's great. Uh, what else do we got here? Mark asked another question. What is platelet lysate? Platelet lysate is just a different form of PRP. It's it's a it's a form of PRP that actually can be injected around nerves, 
and into precarious areas like the epidural space. Um, you don't want to inject whole platelets into the into the, so platelet lysate is kind of a broken down version of of a typical whole platelet PRP um, where you can inject that safely into the epidural space or into the spine or around nerves. And it creates a good healing effect without causing additional inflammation in areas where we don't want it to. So similar applications, uh, but for different areas of the body. All right. See you then, Justin. I appreciate it. Um, Andrew asks, does the needle piercing through the muscle and possibly the nerves risk damaging them? So that's a very specific question, Andrew. Um, Anytime a needle goes into the skin, you know, so part of the reason that we use the, the fluoro guidance and the ultrasound guidance is so that when we place a needle into these structures, we are avoiding any areas that we don't want to be or any structures that we don't want to be around. So yes, if you pierce a needle, if you pierce a nerve with a needle, it will cause damage. But that's the reason that we're using these, um, these very precise guidance procedures and these precise um, approaches because you don't want to be just blindly injecting in the joints or blindly injecting into areas where you don't know what's there underneath the skin and into situations where you might not be hitting the area that you want to hit and you might be injecting the cells into an area that you don't want to. Um, so, you know, yes, if you, you can cause nerve damage if you, if you hit a nerve with a needle, but you know, the reason we're using these approaches that we do is so that that does not happen. Um, Christina asks, if you have arthritis, the stem cells are not going to heal it. So I've, I already answered this question. Um, it helps with protecting your, it helps with protecting uh, the arthritis that you have and, and reducing the pain from the arthritis and helping with the knee stability. Our, what people have to remember is that arthritis and arthrosis are very different processes. Um, arthritis is the is what happens when the joint gets inflamed and it gets irritated and it starts to be painful. Arthrosis is what happens when the joint just starts to break down. And that happens naturally. Our, I mean, our bodies are not perfect machines. So the generative change happens as we age. It happens from injuries. It happens from all sorts of different things. But you can have degenerative change, and most people do have degenerative change without having pain. So there's a reason why the body maintains that pain-free sort of environment while still having that degenerative change. So when you go to an orthopedic doctor and they do an x-ray and they say, you have bone-on-bone -bone arthritis in your right knee, and maybe your right knee hurts, but they're like, oh, look, your left knee's not too far behind it. There's a reason that there's still you know, you don't have pain, but you can still have degenerative changes. So there's always, you know, you can always fight against that pain and you can always stabilize the body to where maybe you will have arthritic change, but you're not going to have necessarily pain that's associated with that. So that's how we're preventing this pain. Uh, and that's why these procedures are so great is it actually does reestablish that better homeostasis within the joint so that, you know, your body is, is feeling good about how that joint is working and how you're operating. And that's where the success comes and stays. Again, great questions, guys. Um, what else we, we got? Doesn't look like there's anything else right now. So I, I've, I've put a lot of information on your plates, uh, and, and I really appreciate you guys, um, asking the questions that you are. And, and, uh, it's been great. Um, I'm going to go ahead and, uh, and, and sign off here, but, um, you know, if you guys are interested and, and you feel like this is something you really want to investigate, I would highly recommend giving us a call again, the numbers 412-963-6480, uh, ask for a consult with us. I'm happy to answer all the questions that you guys have in person. Uh, I'd love to see you. I'd love to go through some of these different exams and, and see what you guys have going on and, and hopefully provide some answers um, if I haven't already tonight. Uh, and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll do our best to get you guys back to good activity. I appreciate all the questions again. Thank you guys for being here. And, uh, and uh, I'm happy to help out however I can. All right. Good night. And uh, 
give us a call. We'll talk soon. Thanks. Bye.